for good. So, Father God, I just pray right now that you would awaken this generation. Lord, that they be awakened for good. Father God, that there would be no falling asleep at the wheel any longer. Lord, that they would not fall to influences or drug addictions. Father God, that they would not fall because of those people in their life that shouldn't be there. Lord, we pray that you would remove those relationships out of their lives right now in the name of Jesus. We rebuke the devourer that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And Lord, we just, we just thank you for the souls that are coming into the kingdom, even this year. Father God, for the souls. Lord, for the multiplication of your body. In Jesus' name. I'm going to ask Hunter to come up. We've talked a lot. The theme of our camp this week was demonstration. Uh, first, we had our summer camp. It was Camp Catalyst, and we talked a lot about being a catalyst for God and learning to have great food, fruit of the Spirit and, and uh, to build character, to cultivate character. And now I felt like, we felt like in this winter retreat, it was important to now that we have established a firm foundation in Christ and their relationship with Christ to start talking about the gifts of the Spirit and using it. And I tell you what, these kids were prophesying. They were seeing visions. They were praying for the sick. On uh, Friday night, we got to go to um, downtown Disney. And we did what we call a treasure hunt. We prayed for a little while while we were at the house. Uh, Dr. Yune came out, and she did an awesome training for the kids on the gifts of the Spirit and on evangelism. And we got a chance to pray for who God wanted us to speak to. So what would happen is we, we saw pictures in our mind of the person or an article of clothing or something that we were supposed to look for when we went out to downtown Disney. And when we got there, the mission was just to pray for people and to try and find those treasures. And we had a, a lot, it was a learning experience, I think, for the kids. This is one of the first times that we've gone out and done um, outreach just as a, a whole youth group. We've done some with Alan, uh, and he's awesome. We love going out with him. Uh, but this was the first time as a youth group that we took everyone. And we were learning that sometimes that there's, there's some re rejection in, in evangelism. Sometimes you gotta, you got to have faith to keep going even though somebody might turn you down to receive prayer, and we're learning how to start conversations, but it all started um, with just an idea that we need to start demonstrating as the body of Christ. This generation, they're not going to wake up because you're, you're screaming at them. They're going to wake up because they experience God for themselves. They're going to wake up because of demonstration in the body of Christ. So in order to receive demonstration, there are some principles that we have to live by, and I'm going to hand it over to Hunter to start this. And uh, we want to take this moment, and uh, are Life Kids going out today? They're staying in? Okay, cool. I'm just making sure they don't want to do wrong. Um, so we got a couple of principles that we went over this weekend uh, for, for demonstration to happen. Um, you know, we look at the body of Christ today. We look at the church, especially in America, and we watch as uh, Sunday after Sunday goes. Sunday after Sunday goes. Years go by. Decades go by, and we don't see anything miraculous happening in much of the Church of America, especially. We see Sunday happen. We hoorah, yay, yay, whoa, whoa, woo-hoo, and then we go home, and we live our lives, and nothing ever changes. Um, something's got to change in order for something to change. You know, they, 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 they say the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again expecting different results so if we stay the same we stay doing what we're doing we never get out of our comfort zone we never do something that we've never done before we will never see anything different happen but there's some principles that we need to see uh, see and apply to our lives in order to see demonstration happen when we talk about this generation I believe this generation is very much like the generation that that Jesus encountered in the days of old that that Jesus could not just speak a word and have salvation. Everywhere Jesus went, he didn't just speak a word. He demonstrated the power of God. Whether it was through love, whether it was through miracles, whether it, it didn't matter how he did it, somehow, some shape, some form of the power of God would always enter the room when Jesus entered the room. He would not simply speak and leave, which is what a lot of the times we end up doing. We speak Hoorah, hey, yay, woohoo. And we go home. Ooh, lunch, fried chicken. 
And then we go about our lives, but we never actually press in and we never get to the point where we say, you know what, I have to have the power of God. God, you have got to move on every service. And we're privileged here at Legacy. We have the leadership team that we do that we, we get to experience God weekly. We're privileged. Everybody doesn't have that. But we need more. See, the Bible says we're to go from glory to glory and faith to faith. So if we're staying in the same place, once again, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over, expecting different results. So we have this vision for God Day. We have this vision for a Shekinah Dome. We have this vision for thousands saved. We have this vision for a city can be saved in a day, right? But if we don't change what we're doing, we don't get farther. You can only get so farther with where you're at. Now, the principle that, that we focused on with the kids to start the camp off was we focused on this little thing that America's lost for the most part. It's called honor. In the New Testament, when, when we see honor mentioned most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time, we see the word time. If I'm saying it wrong, Harvest, you can... But it's spelt time, but they put the line over the E, like the flat line. You know, not the squiggly one that, that everybody uses for Spanish. No, the, the flat one. The flat one. It's, they, they, put that, they put that line over the E, and it, it becomes time instead of time. But the definition of that word in the Greek, when we actually look at the, at the root word there, it's the value of something, the price that something is given. It's, it's the, the number in which we put on something that defines its value. It's the amount we pay or receive for the transference of goods. That's, that's literally what that, what that word means in the Greek. So when Jesus starts talking about honor, he's talking about how much do you value X? So when he says, honor your mother and father, he's asking, how much do you value your mother and your father? Do you value them highly? Because when you value them highly, when you honor them greatly, that's when life, abundant life, Long life happens. But it's not based on a word like, oh, I honor you. See, because if we just say something and we don't do it, if we talk and we don't walk, if we don't back ourselves up, then our honor is empty. Our honor will stay empty forever if we don't actually act it out. See, the book of Acts was called the book of Acts because they act. It wasn't called the book of sit. It wasn't called the book of stay. It was called the book of act because they acted it out. Now, I want to show you how God responds to honor. This is, today, it's, it's, there's two things we want you to see. We want you to see the honor that you give towards God. I want you to see the honor that you give towards people and what it does for your life. Now God can respond one of two ways dependent on your honor, how you honor Him. God can accept and make you thrive or He can quite literally reject and keep you from. So we're talking about demonstration. We're talking about demonstrating in the world, right? Let's not lose that. A key ingredient to demonstration is honor. Without honor, demonstration does not happen. For demonstration to exist, honor must be applied. So, this was so true, this principle is so true, that it quite literally applied to Jesus himself when he acted on earth. So, Mark 6, verse 1. This is NLT, if you can go ahead and turn there. Uh, Mark 6, verse 1, we see Jesus... Shortly after his ministry starts, we see him return into a pretty interesting place. Anybody know where Nazareth was or what its significance 
was. I'm, I'm a youth pastor, so my questions aren't rhetorical. <laughs> my questions are totally expecting you to answer. Somebody can just shout it out. What was the significance of Nineveh? Not, not Nineveh, Nazareth, wow. I'm a youth pastor, give me some grace. What was the significance of Nazareth? Jesus was born there. Jesus grew up there. Huh? Only the youth answered, yeah. I'm a youth pastor, be proud of me. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, verse 1, Jesus left that part of the country and returned with his disciples to Nazareth, his hometown. The next Sabbath he began teaching in the synagogue, and the many that heard him were amazed. They asked, where did he get all this wisdom and power to perform such miracles? Then they scoffed. He's just a carpenter, the son of Mary and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon. And his sisters, they live right here among us. They were deeply offended and refused to believe in him. Then Jesus told them, a prophet is honored everywhere except in his hometown and among relatives and his own family. And because of their, their unbelief, he couldn't do any miracles among them except place his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. There's a couple of keys to this scripture. Back up a little bit, Dave. I want him to see it. Back up a little bit. Go to verse 5. I want you to read this with me. And because of their own belief, he couldn't do anything, any mighty miracles among them, except place his hands on a few sick people and heal them. Now, I'm going to jump here. I want you to see this. What's this word? Woo. What's that one? <laughs> couldn't. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me read it over here. What's this one? Couldn't. It does not say wouldn't. It does not say did not want to. It does not say didn't feel like it. It doesn't say they made him mad. So he just was like, Haha, sorry people, I'm not going to do anything for you. This is Jesus we're talking about. We're talking about the Son of God. We we're talking about God embodied in flesh. A couple weeks ago, we talked about the Word became flesh, right? This is that man. This is that God man. But what does that word say? Couldn't. Could not. Not would not. Not didn't want to. Could not. Why? Because of the unbelief. Because they had to scoff at him. He's just a carpenter. He's Mary's son. We know him. He potty trained here. We watched him make his first little wood cup, his first little wood horse. We learned, he, he learned how to carve wood here. He, stole, he tried to go into my house and get his ball from my backyard one time, and it bothered me. He was loud in the middle of the night, and he woke me up. He was praying. We know this guy. He's, he's nobody significant. Come on. How did, how did he get this wisdom? But because of their dishonor, because they could not value, remember the word value, time, is what the price something is, how valuable something is. But because they couldn't value Christ, not he wouldn't, not he didn't want to, he could not demonstrate in Nazareth. Whew. Jesus can't demonstrate in Nazareth. Now, here we see Jesus like, oh my goodness. Mark, when Mark accounts it, Mark, Mark says, oh my goodness. He didn't do anything and he was really surprised and he was just couldn't believe their unbelief. Now, if you go, if you go to Luke... And you read Luke's account of it. I'll just kind of paraphrase. You don't have to necessarily go there. But if you go to Luke and you read Luke's account of it, 
Jesus doesn't just, look, you know, Luke's the physician, so he's real detailed, you know, writing prescriptions and whatnot. He's, he's real detailed. He doesn't say that Jesus was just like, oh my gosh, I can't believe it, and left. He, he, he literally shows Jesus, like, retorting and, like, go, going hard on him, like, yo, y'all are terrible. Like, rebuking them. He, 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 Jesus turns around when they say, when they mock him and then we scoff at him, Jesus turns back at him and says, I suppose next you'll quote this, this proverb that, why don't you hear yourself, prophet? And he just goes off, hits them right where they want to go next, and he says, you know what? In the days of Elijah, he, he supplied all the needs for a widow. Do you think, do you really think that there were no widows in Israel? There were no widows in Israel that needed food in the middle of a famine. You remember, y'all remember what I'm talking about, right? Elisha, or Elijah, I think it actually was. He goes and he, you know, he, he, said, he asked the widow woman, can I please have a morsel of bread and a cup of drink? And, and then, you know, the oil, and it keeps going. You, you know that part, right? So he went to a different country for that. But do you really think that, that he, Jesus looks back at him, do you really think that there wasn't any widows in Israel? But God sent him to another place. Why? Because the people in Israel did not honor him. Therefore, demonstration would not happen there. He couldn't have done it. It wouldn't have happened. And then Jesus goes on and says, do you really think in the days of Elisha that there was no lepers in Israel? Because, you know, Elisha goes to Syria, right? And he heals the leper and everybody's, oh. He says, you really think there's no lepers in Israel? There's nobody that can't walk in all of Israel. Do you really think that? And he says, but the prophet was sent somewhere he was honored. The prophet was sent to somewhere they would respect the authority that he carried. The prophet was sent somewhere that they would value the gift of God. So what I take from this, what I see in the word, is I see that when God sees dishonor, when we dishonor God, God literally pushes us away from demonstration. He does not just say, ooh, every once in a while... He, he keeps us away from demonstration. He, he kind of like says, eh. No, he's not going to not come near you. God is love. God will be near you. God will always love you. God is always there for us. He'll never forsake us. He'll never leave us. But there's a difference when you start talking about demonstration. There's a difference when you start seeing the power of God move, move and shake cities. Honor has to be applied. We see a different story right after that. Nazareth happens. Jesus has all this flip out moment. Whoa. Everything goes crazy. Jesus can't do any miracles. That's a first. Next thing you know, Jesus moves on to the next place. And I'm going to read from Luke 4. And this is the New King James, I believe. Then he went down to Capernaum a city in Galilee, and was teaching them on the Sabbath. And they were astonished at, astonished at his teaching, for his word was with authority. Now in the synagogue there was a man who had a spirit of an unclean demon, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying, Let us alone. We want nothing to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth. Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him in their midst, it came out of him and did not hurt him. Then they were all amazed and spoke amongst themselves, saying, What, what, what a word is this? For, the author, all, for with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. And the report about him went out to every place in the surrounding region. Now he arose from the synagogue and entered Simon's house. But Simon's, wife, Simon's wife's mother, that is so hard to follow, but Simon's wife's mother 
was sick with a high, high fever, and he made a request of him concerning her. So he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her, and she immediately rose and served them. When the sun was setting, all those who had any that were sick with various diseases were brought then they brought them to him, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And demons also came out, many crying out and saying, You are the Christ, the Son of God. And he, rebuking him, rebuking them, did not allow them to speak, for they knew he was the Christ. This is the next city. This is like Jesus leaves Nazareth and is like, Let me walk over here. Next place. So here we are in Nazareth. No honor. No respect for him. He can't do anything but heal a couple little sick people. He can't. Then the next city, this happens. Why? They were astonished at his teaching, for his word was with authority. Next thing they say, come on a little down. Then they were amazed and spoke among them, saying, what a word is this? For with authority and a power he commands unclean spirits and they come out. And the report of him spread to every place in the surrounding region. So you start seeing God honored. You start seeing these people say, holy, holy, holy. You are, you, so much honor is in this place. Quite literally that the demons that were in this city honored Jesus more than the people in Nazareth. He cast demons out and they say, you are the Christ. But Nazareth says, oh, he's a carpenter. I want you to see that. Demons, the enemy of God, cannot help but to honor him. The very opposite of what God is cannot help but to stand and say, holy, you are the Christ, and obey his commands. Yet we as simple-minded people sit and say, but he's just a carpenter. We got to wake up. We got to start to honor the king. We got to start to stand on the word of God that he is this almighty, all-powerful, omnipotent, omnipresent, wonderful, majestic, glorious, mighty, glory-filled ever changing ever reigning king but if we don't ever recognize his value we'll never recognize his movement if we don't recognize his value we'll never see him demonstrate we'll be stuck in a place like the people in Nineveh where he he can't I keep doing that last time I preached I kept saying Daniel, I know I kept saying David instead of Joshua, and this time I keep saying Nineveh instead of Nazareth. I'm going to start like quoting myself in the mirror over and over again. It's just Nazareth, 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 Nazareth. Got it. One day, one day, one day. But Christ, you, you see Christ here being honored. You see God honored. So we see the difference of God gets dishonored, And God says, you know what? I am not going to demonstrate here because I have no honor here. Because they don't respect me. Because they don't release me into the earth. See, because God put a limitation on himself. God said, I will operate through my people in the earth, right? So he, he says, you know what? From this day on, I will operate through my people. Man will be my channel into the earth. So if we dishonor God and disconnect ourselves from the demonstration, if we say, no, God, you're not great, you're not mighty, you're not who you say you are, then he's not going to move in our presence because he doesn't have access. You've stopped the flow. You've you've stopped the ability of God moving because you've not given him access through honor. See, because for demonstration to happen, honor must be applied. So you get to the next place, they honor God, they value him highly. 
And God moves greatly. He's healing people in the synagogue. He's healing people in Simon's house. He's healing everybody that comes to, that's sick. I mean, demons are flying out of people everywhere. He's not even having to st- spend a lot of time. He's not so sanda for five hours. He's quite literally come out, come out, healed, come out, healed. It's not a hard thing. It's not something he has to spend a lot of time on. See, because it's a gift. So we forget that these things that, that operate demonstration in the, in the world. We talked with the youth this weekend and we started, have, we started having a conversation about prophecy when Yune was there. And we were activating them with prophecy. And Yune started talking about, you know, we're going to stand up and you guys are going to get up. You're going to pray over one another for a moment. You're going to pray in tongues. Next thing you know, you're going to prophesy. And all the kids were like... I've got like two kids on the right like, i I never done that before. <laughs> what do you mean prophesy? How does that feel? Does it feel like a needle poking you? What does it feel like? And, and Yune's like, yeah, you're going to prophesy. So, you know, we looked at him. We said, you know what? You got to realize this is a gift. They're not called the sometimes you get them of the Spirit. They're not called they happen on accident of the Spirit. Are they? They're not called the we throw a coin in the air and if it lands on heads, yeah, we can do it. Let's go. (laughs) But if it lands on tails, run away because the devils are coming. (laughs) They're, They're called the gifts. And they're called that for a reason. If I give a gift... It's the person I give it to. If, if, if I hand my dad and I say, here, here you go, it's, 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 it's no longer mine. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah. I know, you gave it to me. But, but if, I, if, if, if I give a gift, it's that person's. It's no longer mine. It's that person's. Does that make sense? So God has transmitted this gift called healing. He's transmitted this gift called tongues. He's transmitted this gift called the interpretation of tongues. He's transmitted this gift called prophecy. He's transmitted this gift called words of knowledge, words of wisdom, and so on. Right? So are they yours? Now, if I've got an iPhone, which I do, because, you know, if you had an Android, you might, you might just be, uh, you, 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 you might, I'm not going to go there. I worked at Apple for two years, so I can't, I can't help it. But I got an iPhone, and if I have this iPhone, right, it's mine, huh? Deliverance. That's a gift, too. I got it. But... If I've got an iPhone and I want to text Julian, right? Now, if I, if I want to text Julian, I open my phone, I go to my app, and I say, hi, exclamation point, smiley face, winky face, sticking tongue out face. This face. And I hit send. And it happens. And it gets there. Why? It's mine. It does what I say to do. Oh. Wait a minute. Oh, hold on. Hold on a second, Pastor Hunter. What you're telling me is that when something's mine, it does what I want it to do? You mean it does what it's supposed to? You mean, you mean that this slinky does what it was made to do because it does it? You mean if, if I get this slinky, what you mean to tell me, if I get this slinky and I take the headband off of it because pink elephant is over, maybe. Maybe it'll work with it, I don't know. But if I get the slinky and I knock it down the stairs, no, it's not going to work with the, with the headband on it, is it? No, it's not. But if, if I tell something to do what it's supposed to do, it'll do it, right? It was designed for it. Now, famous words. Here we go. You ready? 
My youth, are you ready for my, my, my famous words? You ready? Can you guess what they are? Can, can, can you guess? No, not non-honor. <sighs> can, you, can you guess? Yeah, that's it. As it is in heaven, so it is in the, or as it is on earth, so it is in the spirit. As it is, yeah, that works. That works. Different wording. As it is in the natural, so it is in the spirit. So if something is designed to do something in the natural, what does it do? It does what it was designed to do, unless it's poorly designed, like an android. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Much love to all y'all Android people. I still love you. Jesus still loves you. He loves you even though you sin. <laughs> but his word says something like, uh, why call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things I say? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> what? It come from the garden. Yeah. But... It does what it's designed to do. Now, let me just communicate a really complicated, deep, crazy, unbelievable thought. And it really is unbelievable to our generation at this point, I guess. You were designed to use the gifts. You were designed to heal the sick. You were designed to raise the dead. You were designed to prophesy. Jesus said, these things that I do and greater shall you do because I go to my Father. Did he not? So if he said it, and you know you were designed for it, it's that simple. Now, we've established that when you honor God, Demonstration happens. When you don't honor God, demonstration doesn't happen. Now, I want to hand it over to my wife. She's got a couple things for you. We're going to hit it, and we're going to get it done. Give it up for my husband. That's awesome. <laughs> honor is a, a principle that we need to be applying in our, in our lives every day. And there's, there's an awesome teaching by John Bevere for anyone who wants to learn more about honor called Honor's Reward. So please, if, if you can, get that book, get the teaching series. It's amazing. Um, but we're going to talk a little bit more about honor. First, we talked about honoring God, which is what Hunter talked about, so that demonstration can happen. But now I want to talk to you about honoring your authorities, honoring people in your lives. Um, if you'll go with me to John chapter 2 and the first verse. It says, on the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Jesus said to her, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. That cracks me up. I, I, when I read that, I was like, I'm sure he didn't say it like that, but that's just, like, hilarious. Woman, what does that have to do with me? Like, what? We don't have wine? I'm Jesus. Like, what? What does that have to do with me? So it goes on. And his, his mother said to the servants, she doesn't even respond to him. He does not even acknowledge the fact that he said, he said that doesn't concern me. And he, she turns to the servants and says... Do whatever he says to you, or do whatever he says to do. From there it goes on and it says, Now there were a set of six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. Jesus said to them, Fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. 20 or 30 gallons apiece, and they were made of stone. Six of them. That's a, that's a lot. I can hardly carry two gallons of milk. Like, I'm so weak. And these servants, these servants are carrying stone jars with 20 or 30 gallons of water. They're carrying them all the way down to the water source, filling them up with water, carrying them all the way back. That's not a small task. But yet, they just go do it. And this, again, he, this is the first miracle that Jesus 
performs. So they have not seen anything like this before. And yet they're, they're sitting there, Mary, even the mother of Jesus has never seen a miracle done by Jesus. Okay, so this is, this is just like the very first one. The disciples, even though they had chosen to follow him, had not seen a miracle done by Jesus yet. Think about that. They were out there fishing in their boats, and he says, come follow me. There wasn't even demonstration, nothing. They had nothing to go on, no evidence. And yet, he, when he said come, there was an authority that he spoke with, and that was enough. That was enough for them to honor him and to follow him. So back to this story, they say, Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast, and they took it. When the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom, and he said to him, every man at the beginning sets out the good wine, and when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior, you have kept the good wine until now. This is the beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. So there was a greater level of faith that was established in the disciples at that moment. But I believe, I don't know that that water had even turned into wine yet before the servant took the cup to the master because it still calls it water. So he's, he's drawing water out of it, and he says, take this to the master. That servant's probably thinking in his mind, you want me to take him some water when he asks for wine? Like, he's going to stone me. You realize that. Like, but that's, instead of counteracting what Jesus had to say or saying anything to Jesus, they took the cup and they brought it to the master. And the master said, this is better than anything that I've had. This is amazing. Now, there's, symbol, there's so much symbolism in this, in this first miracle that happens. The water in the pots, it is a, a symbol of spiritual cleansing. So there's this, there's this time where... They would, they would wash their hands. They'd use the water, the water to wash their hands. So it's, it, was, it was something that was uh, established in the Old Testament, uh, a rule that they had to wash themselves. And so it, it's, it has to do with cleansing. Jesus had them fill six pots. And the number six represents mankind. So there's six pots representing mankind, and they're filled with water that's cleansing. The wine represented the blood of Jesus. So what, what was happening here is Jesus was taking the old ways of cleansing and he was changing the old ways of cleansing mankind into a new wine. And then when he took the wine to the master, the master said, this wine is better. This is so much better. So there's this, there's this symbolism in this first miracle that he did. Now, even though he said, my time has not yet come when his mother had talked to him about doing it in the first place. But, there, but still, God knew, God knew, this, this has to be done. I have to make a symbol of what's going to happen with my son's life. So take these six pots, take mankind, take their ways of cleansing, and let's just throw that out. Let's go ahead and dip us a cup of new wine from the presence of the Holy Spirit and allow that to cleanse over our lives. Now, Jesus said, my time has not yet come, but why then, why then did he still do the miracle? Somebody tell me. Why, what, honor, honoring who? His mother. So even, even Jesus, he understood the principles of honor. He knew, he was God in mankind. He was God in man form, God in flesh. And he said, my time has not yet come. But even God had to submit to his authority in that moment. Even God, because of the way that this earth is set up, because his word says, honor your father and mother, God himself in flesh form had to honor his authority. He had to, do, he had to demonstrate based on that principle. Now, the definition of honor he's talked about earlier is to respect. It's a, it's a respect that's given to someone who's admired. But in the Old Testament, in Exodus 20, 12, it says, Honor your father and mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. That word for honor in that phrase is actually kabod. Everyone say kabod. It means to be heavy, be weighty, grievous. It's, it's the opposite of taking something lightly. This is the exact word that's used in the Old Testament 
to describe the significance, the importance, the heaviness of the glory of God, the very presence of God. He used the same word that they used to describe the honor that they were giving him for the honor that we were to give to our parents. Now, parents, I believe when he said honor your father and mother, that this is not only a natural thing, but a spiritual thing. You don't, you, yes, you need to honor your father and your mother, your natural father and mother, but you also need to honor your spiritual father and your mother. The authorities in this world that God has placed around you. It says in the word that all authorities are from God. Not necessarily all authorities obey God, but they are, have been set in place by God because what God establishes, no man can take away. God, God still has control. God still has a hand to do and to take somebody out if they're going to harm everyone around them, if necessary. So in order, there's a lot of times where God will place a person over you. And you have to find a way to honor them even though they're not honoring God. Because that's what God commands you to do. And we, we've talked about, the, the kids and, and I, this week, we talked about honor and how it can be really hard. Sometimes there are children in this generation who have parents who are telling them to do things that contradict God's word. So how in those situations, how in those scenarios, do you honor God? When my mom was growing up, she grew up in a very abusive home. Um, and she endured a lot of hardship. There were th some things that happened. And, and there was... Time, there were times when my grandfather would be very hurtful to her, would say things that would harm her. And she, she somehow, God, God found a way to help her to experience the Holy Spirit. And when she, when she experienced the Holy Spirit, she now was balancing this, this uh, honoring game, trying to figure out how do I honor God and honor my father? She was going to go to college. She got a full scholarship, a full, or a full ride scholarship to a, a college in Kansas. That's where my grandfather wanted her to go. And he said, he used some control and manipulation. He said, you know, if, if, you, if you go there, I'll take care of you. I'll provide for you. I'll make everything happen. But if you go anywhere else, you're cut off. That's it. Like, he wanted, he wanted to tell her where she was supposed to go. But when she was praying, she felt in her spirit that she was supposed to go to Oral Roberts University. And she felt very strongly that that's where she was supposed to go. And so she was asking God, you know, God, how, if I can't even provide for myself, how am I going to get to that school? That's an expensive school. Um, and long story short, there was a lady that calls her not long from there from Oral Roberts University. And she said, I was, I was in my sleep, I was, I was dreaming, and I saw this computer. And there was a name across the computer, a name that I've never seen before, Nanette Stoskoff. That's my mother's maiden name. That's not a common name, <laughs> just for the record. Nanette Stoskoff. So she sees this name, and she finds the number, and she says, and now I'm calling you because I believe that you're supposed to come to Oral Roberts University. And I want you to know that you have a full scholarship here waiting for you that God is providing for you that it's taken care of. Now, from there, she said, okay, God, I get it. You've provided for me, but I don't want to dishonor my father by going against what he wishes for me. So she began to fast and to pray and say, Lord, you can channel the hearts of kings like water. So won't you change the heart of my father so that I can be in your will and not contradict your word? And a few weeks later, as she, after she had prayed and fasted, my grandfather called her and said, you can go to that school. She's like, excuse me? You can go to that school. That was it. That was the end of the conversation. That's all she got, but that was enough. Now she could honor her father, and she could stay in God's will. So there is always, where there is a will, there is a way. There is always a way to continue honoring your authorities in your life, even if they don't necessarily honor God which is, it's so important. So if you want to see demonstration in your life, you don't just have to honor God, but you have to honor the authorities that he's put over your life. So the, first, we honor God. Second, we honor people. We honor our authorities. And next, what we need to do is be obedient. One of the greatest ways to show honor 
to someone is to obey what they say, to submit. This form, I believe, of honor should, should go first and foremost to God. You should follow and obey everything that he says, and then to the authorities that he's placed over your life. But, like I said, there are times when those people will contradict God's, God's word. And it says in Acts 5.29, but Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. So there is, there is a hierarchy of honor and obedience. God first. First and foremost, always honoring God, honoring your authority. Obey God first and foremost. Now, Deuteronomy 13.4 says, You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him, keep his commandments and obey his voice. You shall serve him and hold fast to him. The word for obey is shema, to hear, to listen, to consent and agree with, to, to grant a request. In the Old Testament, rebellion by a child was punishable, punishable by stoning. If the parents got fed up with a child, all it took was the parent taking them out to the elders of the city and saying, this child is rebellious. You can take care of it. That's it. That's all it took. Now, obviously, parents love their children. So I don't think that the first little thing is what they're going to stone them for. I was, I'll just put that out there. I don't think that they're going to look at them and be like, okay, you know, they just dropped some milk on the floor. That's it. Stoning for you. Like, that's, I don't think it was that, that way. But, but seriously, think about how extreme that is. And that was, that was like law. That was in, in the first five books of the Bible, the, the Torah, what God had given them. And so I asked God, I was like, God, that seems kind of harsh. Like, you know, somebody messes up and you're just going to stone them? Like, that's death? That's it? Like, that's all you got? And it, he spoke to me something very significant. He said, rebellion breeds rebellion. He said, if I allow that one person who's making a selfish decision to stay in the camp, the rest of the camp will be infected by rebellion, therefore endangering their lives to the death of hell. Sometimes your authorities, they will make you face consequences, but it's for your own good. It's for the good of those around you. Every choice that you make, it affects someone around you. There's a ripple effect. And so it's, it's important that we realize that these consequences, they're setting us up for good habits. They're setting us up for understanding the principles of God and continuing in his ways before it's too late. You know, as a child, you may endure some consequences from your parents, but I can tell you firsthand that those consequences are going to be nothing compared to what life does to you if you don't know how to live it. You get out in the real world and you're going to face some serious debt if you go using all your credit cards. You're going to, if you use up your budget on some movie tickets when you know you don't have it, you're going to face the fact that you can't pay your bills and your car might get repossessed. And there's no one that's going to be like, oh, it's okay. You know, we'll just get it next time. And that's why it's so important for parents to enforce those consequences because you're doing your child a favor. If you are lenient all the time, then they're not going to understand later on in life how to deal with the consequences. And you, what you're doing is you're setting them up for failure. You cannot love your child and not give them consequences for their actions. You have to. So we have to understand as a people that consequences are a good thing. It's hard. It may not be comfortable. It may not be fun, but they're a good thing. And we have to understand that in order to honor those authorities, in order to obey them, sometimes that, that, that takes reaping the consequences of our actions. Now, we, we talked about honoring God, honoring authorities, obeying authorities. And now I want to talk to you about faith because it's another ingredient of demonstration. Hebrews 11, 1 through 3, who knows that scripture? Probably everyone in here. Now faith is the, the evidence of things not seen. So faith is a, a strong belief. It's a, it's a conviction of something that you haven't necessarily seen with your own eyes. 
but faith is a part of the nine gifts of the Spirit, correct? So it says in, let me find my scripture. It says in Ephesians 3, 7, I became a servant of the gospel according to the gift of God's grace that was given to me by the power of his exor- or by the exercise of his power. Now, I believe that that word exercise is really important. Exercising power, power in the gifts, power in demonstration, power in faith. I believe that that gifts they're like muscles. Let's just let's just explain it that way. I have a bicep and Yune has a bicep. My bicep may not be as strong as Yune's bicep because I'm very small and I can't pick anything up. Now, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm, I'm giving you a, a natural thing right now, okay? So, so we all have biceps, but not all of us have the same strength of biceps. But could we have the same strength of biceps? What does it take to get the same strength? Exercise, exercise. Okay, so, so the more you work your muscles, the stronger they are. The more you work your gift, the stronger they are. I've asked God before, you know, we've prayed over people and I've said, God, I have faith. I know that you are able to do all things. I know that this is possible. I don't doubt at all. I really don't. So why is it sometimes I pray for people that are in wheelchairs and they don't rise up? And he's like, well, you know, you haven't even trusted me to heal that headache last week because you took Excedrin before you prayed? How do you expect me to raise a person out of a wheelchair? You have not exercised your faith in the small things and worked your way up to the big things. If I go to the gym and I try to pick up 500 pounds, it ain't going to happen. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work my back out. I'm actually, I'm going to get discouraged because I'm trying to do things that I'm not, it's not possible for me to do yet because I haven't exercised and worked my way up. So I'm going to start with the bar and I'm going to little by little add on weight. But the importance is every day, right? When you're exercising, it's important to work out every day. What are you doing with your gifts every day? We see people like Joan Hunter, right? She is seeing tumors disappear off of people's necks. She's seeing people healed left and right everywhere in her life, everywhere she goes. But you want to know when she started praying for people and not just any like big things, but little things. She, she lived in, in a ministry with the happy hunters, her parents, they did a healing ministry. So from a very young age, she started praying for people. She was taught how the gift of healing works. And so now in her older age, she's seeing crazy miracles because every day of her life she has exercised her faith she's exercised the gift of healing apostle he can prophesy detail down to tiny details it's like amazing you you hear the things that he says prophetically and you're like how on earth did you get that like that's so much like how like i i just it, i rack my brain thinking there's no way like the dates the times that the colors like all of it is so accurate but he started prophesying when he was very young and it starts out with you know God told me to tell you God loves you it starts out with obedience it starts out with honoring God by obeying the small things you may feel like oh this isn't significant enough but if you don't start there you'll never get to the significant stuff so if you don't obey in your everyday life with your faith with your gifts then it's gonna take a long time maybe never will you see someone raised from the dead So everyday life, you know, when you're walking through Walmart at the grocery store and you see somebody and they need some help, you need to help them out. You need to pray for them. Ask them, you know, what what can I do for you today? How can I pray for you? How can I serve you? We need to start going out and making evangelism a lifestyle. It's not just an event every couple days. It's a lifestyle. It's time for us to get out of our comfort zone. That's the thing about exercising. If you feel comfortable while you're exercising, you're not doing it right. Like, if you, I'm just telling you, I got asthma, so it doesn't take much for me to get uncomfortable when I'm exercising. It doesn't take much to make you uncomfortable in the real world when there's some person standing over there and God tells you to go talk to him, and you're like, I've never seen that person in my life. He has piercings, and he has tattoos, and he has big muscles, and he might punch me. Like, I don't know what he's going to do. Or that guy's Muslim. Like, I don't know, like, how he's going he's gonna to act to that. Anthony, 
he, when we were on our, our, um, our treasure hunt, God told him that he was going to see five, right? Is that what it was? The first five that he sees is a family of Muslims. And he's like, oh, Lord, you know, like, like, what, like what on earth am I going to do? And so he's like, okay, I'm going to do something. So he's like, run. these people are booking it, too. They're, like, on a mission. He's like, okay, what am I going to Like, if I run after them, like, what's, they're going to think I'm weird. Like, I don't, I don't know. But he's, like, we're battling it in his mind, and he just does it. He goes after him and he says, you know, can I pray for you? Is there anything I can pray for you about? And they're like, no, no, we don't do that. You know, and, and, and going on. But the thing with is, the thing with faith is that, you know, stepping out in faith doesn't always mean you're going to get the reaction that you expected to get. Sometimes there is rejection, but guess what? That was an, that was a contact point for those people. If nothing else, they heard the name of Jesus. They understood that there are Christians out there that'll pray for you. And later on down the road, that daughter of that man, she might think, you know, I haven't experienced God like that. There's no one that's ever reached out to me in love like that before. Maybe there's something real there. It's, it's planting a seed. So you may think, oh man, maybe I miss God. You know, they didn't even want my prayers. You know, they didn't want anything to do with me, but you didn't miss God. You didn't. You planted a seed and you can't go wrong. The worst thing that they can do is tell you, no, you can't pray for me, but it's okay. Cause you're going to be praying in your head anyways. <laughs> you're going to be praying blessings over them. You're going to be praying that God would soften their heart. And it, it's still something. It's opening up the door for a miracle in their life later on. So we got to be faithful in the small. It says, those who are faithful in little will be ruler over much. That doesn't just apply to finances. That applies to everything. Those who are full of faith in the little things, they will see big faith in the big things. They will see big demonstration in the big things. But you got to work your way up. So if you're sitting around waiting to raise somebody from the dead, I'm going to tell you, it's just not going to happen. Not until you start using your gift on the little things. The biggest place that Hunter and I have seen miracles and signs and demonstration in our marriage is definitely finances. And I, I want to explain to you guys why that's the biggest area and, and tell you a few testimonies. Because the things that God has done for Hunter and I financially have been, like, it, it's been phenomenal. I, don't, I can't even explain to you things. It's literally like money rains out of nowhere. And we're just like, what? Like, where did this come from? But my parents taught me to tithe from a very young age. I don't think that I ever got money that I didn't tithe on. Like, it, it, it started from very small. I got an allowance, I tithed on it. I got a birthday gift, I tithed on it. That's how it works. And not only that, but my parents taught principles of giving. My dad is a very giving man. He loves to give gifts. He loves to give. I mean, he has sowed into this house, into our lives. He's sowed into many churches. He's kept doors open for churches in, a, in Canton where many churches couldn't afford to pay their own buildings pay. It, it, it's, that's just the kind of man he is. And so growing up with some great example like that gave me the opportunity to start exercising that gift of financial miracles at a very young age. I remember when I wanted my first car, I told God, I want a Cadillac. And people were like, you want a Cadillac? You're 16 years old. Like, why do you want a Cadillac? Like, that's a really expensive car. You know what you're getting yourself into, right? But my dad had drived a Cadillac, and my grandfather had drived a Cadillac, and I wanted to be just like my father. And that, that meant the world to me. And so I told God, I said, okay, God, I am going to sell everything that I have, and I want a Cadillac that I can afford. Sure enough, a few months before my 16th birthday, we found a Cadillac for $800. And it was in great condition, and it was awesome. Like, God, God gave me, not, did, not only did he fill a need of a car, but he filled the want, like, what style of car I wanted. It's, he doesn't want to just bless you with your needs. He wants to give you more than enough. He wants to bless you with what you want. A little further down the road, we, you know, um, I, was, I was praying. Hunter and I were praying. We, we were going to get married. My dad told him, listen, there's this amount of money that I want you to have in savings before you get married. It, you know, it's going to be a buffer. You need to have, yeah, okay, it wasn't a small amount. There's, we believe in, in you know, budgeting, in, in setting yourself up for success. So what, you know, what he told him is, I need to know that you're a steward of your money, that you've got something in savings so that if an emergency happens, you're able to take care of my daughter. I think that's simple enough. I have taken care of her her whole life, and I'm not just going to hand over the most precious thing in the world to you without a plan. So 
here's the plan, here's the amount of money that you need to have in your account for several months to take care of her if, you know, you lose your job or whatever it is. Well, we worked really hard. Both of us were saving money, a lot of money. And, well, it was to us at that time. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so we're saving up money, and we get in church one day, and God tells us both, well, he tells Hunter, he says, you know, I want you to give it all. Now, I'm sitting next to him not knowing that that's what God told him. And he's saying, I want you to give it all. And we're both sitting in our seats not knowing what the other's thinking, thinking, please talk me out of this. Please talk me out of this. Please talk me out of this. This is all we got. It is physically impossible for us to get this amount of money by our wedding day. And he's going to cancel the wedding. My dad don't joke. So... <laughs> So we're like, okay, God, are you sure? Like, we know you said that we were supposed to get married. So if it's in your will that we get married, maybe we shouldn't give this money. Like, it doesn't make sense. But the things of God don't always make sense. So we give the money, and we, we brought it to Apostle, and we're like, okay, we need your prayer for some blessings. <laughs> Take this money. And he starts laughing, and both of us are like, why is he laughing? This is not funny. Like, there's nothing funny about this. And he's like, I'm laughing because God told me to do the same thing before I got married. Little did we know, God told my parents to do the same thing before they got married. They had saved up all their money, and God told them to give it. And he said, if you give to me, if you provide for my house, I'll provide for you. He did amazing miracles for both sets of parents after they got married. And so we, we saved as much, got to our wedding day, and we still didn't have the money. But my dad said, I'm believing in faith. I'm going to let this go on because you obeyed God. But I'm believing and I'm, I'm going to have faith with you that by the end of today, you're going to have this money. Now, we, we, had, we had signed up for a registry. We had a pretty large wedding. My dad's church, he invited the whole church. So we were supposed to have like 500 guests. And we go to Beth, Bed Bath & Beyond to the registry and they tell you to like scan like two get, gifts per person that's supposed to be there just in case they want you know, give them options of prices and different things like that. That's what you're supposed to do. So we're like scanning up the store like a thousand gifts. Okay. I don't even know what that is. Sure. Why not? Like we're like going through scanning all sorts of things. Like we didn't even know what it was. Some of it we really wanted other like or needed other things we didn't, you know, we didn't need. Before that, we also, we, did, we also needed a, uh, hmm? yeah. Or we just needed more gifts on our registry. But <laughs> But then we also, we also needed furniture. So we don't have savings. We don't got furniture for our apartment. And we don't got anything that goes in the apartment. <laughs> and we're like getting to our wedding day. We're like, okay, God, right about now, this will be a good time <laughs> to return that favor. <laughs> and so first thing that happens is we get all of our furniture given to us. Everything. Not even just furniture, but television. Huge television. And not only that, but it wasn't just, like, furniture that's, like, uh, yeah, we, th we thought we were going to be living in a furniture graveyard. Like, you know, you go to Go Goodwill and nothing matches, and it's, like, we just had to fill up our house. Like, that's what we were kind of expecting. We're, like, we don't know, like, what's going to happen. But not only, we got all the different things from different people, and it all matched, and it was all the style that we liked. So it was, like, so cool. We get this whole house full of stuff, you know, full of furniture that we really like, and it fits. Not only that, but we get to our wedding day, and we find out with Bed Bath & Beyond that almost our entire registry is paid for. Like, I mean, the things we need, the things we want, things we didn't even know we wanted, like, everything is taken care of, just, like, a few items. And then we get, like, we got gift cards, like, to finish off our entire registry from that day. Not only that, though, the next morning we're opening cards from the wedding, and God provided seven grand in one day from a wedding. What? Like, that's insane. Like, that was, the, that was the amount we needed to be able to live for several months if an emergency happened. So our house was full of furniture. Uh, we got all the KitchenAid stuff. We got all the bathroom stuff. We got a nice shower head. We got a scale. We got the whole nine yards. And we got, <laughs> yes, yeah, scale. That's really important. Um, <laughs> but, and we got, and we got our entire buffer to set up our finances so that we could be good stewards of what God gave us. In one day, one day, like, you give it all, and I tell you, he's going to multiply it like crazy. I mean, that registry, it was worth probably 
five to seven grand. I mean, it was insane. Like, we were both looking at each other just, like, crying. Like, we're sobbing. Like, how? Like, how on earth? God, this is, you're so great. You're so amazing. Like, this is phenomenal. But that's not even the last of it. We got our entire honeymoon to Hawaii paid by somebody else. It was a gift. And in the same month, I was, got, I was given my new car. So all in one month, we get a car, we get furniture for a house, we get a buffer for our bank account, we get all the fixings for our house, and we get a vacation. One month. Like, what is that? God, you are incredible. It's amazing. Think about that. And that's just, that was just the start. Like, he started off with a bang. God was like, let me show you what I can do because you've honored me with your finances. Your entire life, you have honored me with your finances. So when it matters most, I'm going to honor you in your finances. That, that was just the first of it. Like, this year, there have been times when we have looked at our financial records, and they don't, they don't line up. Like, we're like, there is no way that we have this amount of money in our bank accounts. We would have emergencies happen, you know, car, our tire popped, or, you know, something happened to where, you know, we had a medical bill that we had to pay, and, and it wasn't really within our budget to pay. And we had our buffer, but we were like, you know, God, we want to be able to save that for big emergencies. We don't want to use it if we, can, if we can not. So, Lord, we have $20, and we're going to put it all in the offering, and we're going to pray that you would multiply this and give us what we need. I'm telling you, minutes, this happened probably, what, six, seven times in the last year? Minutes after we gave, someone would come give us a Pentecostal handshake with exactly the amount that we needed for that thing. And that's like beyond the buffer of money, beyond everything that we needed. Just here, here's to take care of that emergency that you need. I got you. God's got this. That's, that is, that's what we've been talking about. Relax. God's got this. He has got you in your gifts. If you honor him with your gifts, he's going to honor your gift. We had, we had times, not only did he honor our gifts or our finances that way, but we went to minister recently, and we were given, like, what? It was like $1,000 to minister for one day, which I'm thinking, like, I, I don't think I'm worth that. Like, I don't, you know, I'm... I, I'm I do what I do. I'm, I'm decent at what I do. But like $1,000, that's like for four hours? What, what is that? $250 an hour? Like God, he was telling me, he says, I value your time. I value your gift. You are worth more than any man could pay you per hour at your job. I value you. I honor you. This is my honor for you. And it's every single time. Every single time we've had a need, God has fulfilled it. And it's gotten to the point where, you know, at first, it was, it was hard to give that money, you know, before the wedding. We were, we were, like, clinching our cheeks, like, okay, God, like, I don't know about this. But now, like, after everything that he's done, we'll just drop money in the offering. We're like, oh, psh, take it, God. Like, we know you're going to do something great with it. You know, it's like it, it, we have gotten to a point, finally, we have exercised our faith to a place where we can cheerfully give. And we can be full of faith that he's going to return on his investment. Like, it, it's amazing how that works. And now, you know, I'm still, I've got some, some gifts that I haven't worked that way. And so in those areas of life, now I'm learning to exercise those. And it's going to take a few years, I know it is, to get to the place where I really want to be using the, God, the gifts of God in their fullness. But it's amazing how just exercising your gift can do that for you. Our parents, every generation, it builds, too. Our parents, the miracles that, that were given to them on their wedding day because they, they gave to God, they were great. But it was nothing compared to this miracle. And it's going to be nothing compared to what my kids are going to receive in the future. It's going to be nothing compared to what my grandchildren are going to receive because we're going to keep walking in the faith. We're going to keep honoring God, and we're going to keep teaching our children from a young age. I'm not just going to teach my kids from a young age to tithe. I'm going to teach them to lay hands on a headache. I'm going to teach them how to demonstrate faith at a young age, to prophesy. You know, kids, be the kids, it says, it says um, in the Bible that you need to be like little children, have the faith of a child, childlike faith. So God places that faith in the beginning of their life. They have it from the very beginning. And even sometimes in the beginning, they have more faith than later on because God, life has so beat them up that they're afraid to use it again. And so we need to, what we need to do is encourage our kids to a place where 
they can't worry about rejection. You know, they were rejected sometimes at downtown Disney. But we're going to teach our kids, rejection's okay. You can shake it off. You can heal, even if that headache doesn't get healed right away. Keep praying. God's going to do it. God's going to do it. He's faithful. His words do not return void to you. So it's not just financial miracles that my children are going to receive. They're going to be raising the dead at a young age. My children will be raising the dead from the time that they can walk. That's what I'm believing. That my children and my children's children will be walking in power and authority and demonstration, working their muscles, bodybuilders of the faith before they've even built their natural muscles. That's what we need. That's what this generation needs, exercising their faith. Exercise your honor. Exercise your obedience and exercise your gifts so that God can demonstrate through you. I know we're a little pressed for for time, but I just, I can't stress to you enough how important it is to honor God. So many people, you know, they, they worry about things and worry is a terrible way to dishonor God. You really don't think he's capable? Do you you really don't think that he can't handle it? He's God. He created you. If he can create something from nothing, he can certainly take care of that situation that you're in right now. Don't allow worry in your life because it dishonors God, making him not be able to honor you. I believe that the highest form of dishonor is seeing something as worthless or a no value. When, when I look at someone and I, I see them as worthless, that's, that's complete dishonor because honor is valuing something, right? So the highest form of dishonor is to see something as worthless. But when you take the cross for granted by not demonstrating your gifts, you are not valuing your gifts, you are saying that the cross is worthless. You're dishonoring God in the highest form. So what we felt so strongly at this camp this week is that we need to repent. The body of Christ needs to repent for taking the cross for granted. For dishonoring him by looking at the cross and saying, I'm, I don't believe that what you, you died could do these things. I don't believe, that's what you're saying when you don't use your faith on the small things. I don't believe that what you did on the cross was enough to take care of this. That's dishonor at the highest form. Father God, I just, I pray right now that you would forgive us. That you would forgive us for taking the cross for granted. That you would forgive us for taking that act for granted. These gifts for granted, Father God. Lord, we're nothing without you. We are only valued because you value us. Lord, I pray that you would teach us. That you would give us discernment to understand the value of the cross. Because there's so much more value than we could ever comprehend in our natural minds. Father God, there's so much more that we could do with the gifts that you've given us. So Lord, show us how to value them. Show us how to use them. Show us how to exercise them in our daily lives. If you're here today and you're feeling God tug on your heart, if you're feeling that conviction of the Spirit, I just want you to pray this prayer with me. Father God, I repent for taking the cross for granted. Forgive me for not exercising my gifts. Help me to see your value. Help me to honor you, to obey you, and to have faith. Thank you, God, for what you did for me. I pray that the cross, the power of the cross, would be active in every area of my life on a daily basis. In Jesus' name, amen.
If you'd stand with me, we have communion elements, and I just think that this is the perfect time for this. Because by remembering the sacraments, by remembering the, the, the blood that was shed, the, the, the stripes on his flesh, we value him. Remembering what he did, did is what honors God. Remembering what he did values him. And kids, if you, um, if you would like to come up here with me and stand with me, all of you from the... Okay, anyone who needs com communion, would you please uh, raise your hand? And then uh, my teens, I'd just like to ask you to come stand with me. When Jesus ate with the disciples, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, broken for you. Take and eat. You can eat your communion. Then he lifted his cup and he said, this is my blood shed for you. Thank you, Jesus. We receive your blood. We receive the power of your blood. Just like you to close your eyes for a minute and listen to the words of this song. The Savior of the world was fallen. His body on the cross, his blood poured out for us. The weight of every curse upon me.